Salam, I am your host Naid Jahed and welcome to 2T's new show, Culturally Incorrect. This is our very first episode of what we hope will be a thought-provoking talk show that challenges our Afghan comfort zone. In each episode, we'll be digging into a topic that's often considered taboo in Afghan culture. From dating and marriage to shame and guilt, no subject matter will be forbidden. Now, you might ask yourself why you should listen to me. Well, as an Afghan American growing up in the US, torn between two cultures, I've personally been affected by almost every topic that we'll be speaking on. My life improved greatly when I found the courage to give voice to my experiences rather than feeling suffocated or ashamed by them. But you should know I'm not just all talk. I'm also a certified mental health therapist. Through that lens, I've spoken to and assessed more than 100 Afghans, people just like you and me. I'm not an expert on all things, and I don't claim to be, but my intention is to converse with those who know more than me to offer various perspectives. Through those discussions, we hope that we can help you develop healthier relationships with yourselves, your families, and our greater Afghan community. Now, a quick disclaimer. Please keep in mind that the target audience for our show are Afghans who live in the West. But of course, our topics could be relevant to anyone who would like to listen with an open mind. Therefore, it's important to note that our opinions and our narrative will fall mainly in the middle amongst those Afghans who are neither too conservative nor too liberal, but we'll do our best to give voice to all sides. As a final note before we start, we'd like to state that the show's producers and 2T Media are fully conscious of the more serious topics concerning our homeland of Afghanistan. Although the subjects we'll be covering will mainly focus on the experiences of Afghans in the West, we do not want to minimize the stories and tragedies of our fellow brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. However, since we live in the West, we want to cover topics that are unique to Afghans living here, abroad. Just as talk shows broadcasting from Afghanistan cover topics that affect people living there. With that said, we're going to jump right into today's episode that affects almost all of us. Afghan dating. Oh yes, we're going there. The popular psychotherapist and author Esther Perel says that the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. And in no other place is that more true than our romantic relationships. We might find that when we're dating someone and things are going beautifully, it is the greatest high in the world. Life is full of bliss and you're on cloud nine. But if we're in conflict with that person and experiencing heartache, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? Dare I say it can feel like a living nightmare. So let's be real. Afghans seem to have a hard time dating. Whether both parties are Afghan or an Afghan is dating someone outside of our culture, there is a lot of baggage we can bring to any dynamic. This leads me to ask, are we building these relationships on an unhealthy foundation? In other words, are we doomed to fail because our Eastern culture actually frowns upon the Western concept of dating that doesn't immediately lead to marriage? Is there even such a thing as healthy dating in Afghan culture? And if so, what would that look like? So, I know I've thrown a lot at you, but let's examine Afghan dating further with our brilliant panel of experts. Okay, in our studio today is Dr. Naid John Nasrat, who holds a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology. She's a professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in DC. Her clinical manual for mental health professionals who work with Afghan refugees has won numerous awards. Also with us in studio is Dr. Rosalind John Rogers, who is a psychologist specializing in refugee mental health and trauma. She holds a PhD in international psychology and is a licensed mental health counselor with over 10 years of clinical experience. And finally, via video from California is Dr. Farid John Yunus, a well-known Islamic studies scholar, 
author and researcher. He holds a PhD in international and multicultural education from the University of San Francisco. He's also a retired professor of cultural anthropology of the Middle East and Islamic philosophy. All three of our brilliant guests today are of Afghan and Afghan American heritage. Thank you for joining us. So my first question is going to be for Dr. Naid Nasrat. Considering we come from an Eastern culture that frowns upon the Western concept of dating, do you think it's possible for Afghan couples here in the West to date in a healthy way? Mm -hmm. And by healthy, I mean free from secrecy and free from shame, among other elements, mm -hmm. of course. Such an incredibly important question. I really appreciate it because I think what you point out, it's a major component, which is yeah. shame, and also the Western and Eastern component, which basically mm -hmm. we come from a collectivistic culture. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to relationship and marriage and all that, these are two kind of uh, philosophies that we subscribe to either from individualistic mm -hmm. component or uh, collectivistic, and sometimes they combine. Mm -hmm. So Afghans come primarily from collectivistic cultures, where shame is the major component to shape our behavior Absolutely. and also kind of make us feel a little bit guilty about things that we do. Mm. So hence, I think that uh, it also depends on what we mean by Afghans, right? Afghan Americans, Afghans who have newly arrived to the U.S. Right. We have been emigrating uh, to this country for the past 45 uh, years. So the very first generation that arrived here and uh, they have completely level of acculturation adjustment to this country mm -hmm. versus those who just arrived a year and a half ago. So Absolutely. there is also cultural differences between the, the, the two many generations. So I would say just to answer your question, it really depends on the culture of the family. Mm -hmm. We cannot generalize it and say Afghans mm -hmm. are like this and that. So you need to understand their acculturation level. You need to understand their level of relationship with their own families and the level of communication. And I would say also that it depends on our, uh, the person's own growth, right? Mm -hmm. So we cannot enter a relationship unless we have gone through our own journey of growth. Yep. Dr. Yunus, my next question is going to be for you. Thank you so much, first of all, for joining us all the way from California. Um, based on your expertise in Islamic psychology and sociology, how much room is there for healthy dating within the blend of Islam and Afghan culture, if there is any room at all? Thank you, uh, and again, uh, thank you for uh, having me in this uh, uh, session. Um, what I'm saying here that uh, according to Islam, uh, mankind being men and women are created free. So um, this is the most important thing that we should know, that we are all created free and make decisions for ourselves, mm -hmm. being a woman or a man. So of course, uh, there are some cultural taboos um, uh, in, in our country, including in the United States, that uh, forbid people to uh, to practice what they desire. But uh, my answer to this is that I call it halal dating. Halal dating. Halal dating. Uh, uh, halal like dating uh, and this is the first time I'm using this word in this uh, international show. Mm -hmm. That since people, men and women, are created free, mm -hmm. they, have, uh, they are responsible for their own deed and creed mm -hmm. and their own moral values. So halal dating is that um, they are not. Uh, having very close relationship, mm -hmm. but they can walk and talk and uh, they can uh, go to a restaurant, have a cup of coffee, uh, uh, learn about each other uh, uh, lifestyle. And, and I promote halal dating because uh, because it's very necessary that people should should know a little bit each other before marrying. Um, right. And uh, and this is not a pure um, uh, Western dating. Uh, but uh, halal dating, there are some limitations, mm -hmm. uh, but, they, but they are allowed to, uh, first of all, they have to choose each other, they have to see each other, they have to talk to each other, and these are all permissible within, within uh, Islamic Sharia. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, I don't see any, any problem that, especially 
young young guys and girls uh, in this country mm -hmm. uh, to to do halal dating and see each other and make a sound decision although it's very difficult from a psychological point of view and there are two distinguished professors here this it's very difficult to know some person mm -hmm. uh, i mean um, uh, even there are people who dated uh, uh, three four years but still they divorced right. it's just because because um, no one knows what is what is in our heart. No one knows uh, really, truly our nature, being a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. So we know each other through social interaction, um, uh, the way we behave in society and this and that. But once a couple get together, it's very difficult to uh, compare the engagement time to married time. So it is difficult to know a man or a woman, mm -hmm. but uh, I do promote a halal dating that they should um, try to learn as much as they can uh, if, uh, in order to have a decent uh, lifestyle in the future. Can I ask, is there actually a term in Farsi or Pashto for dating? Does that exist? Um, actually, as far as I know, <laughs> Farsi and English, uh, there is no um, exact word for it. Um, I see. But um, uh, seeing—that's the only—that's the closest closest seeing translation I could I could come yeah. up with. Probably your distinguished uh, uh, guest could come up with a with a different word, uh, which I will respect. That I think the closest word is seeing each other. So. I think Dr. Dr. Nasrat has an answer for us. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, dating actually very mm, closely uh, translates got, is in Farsi, uh, Dari, Dost Yabi. Dost Yabi. Yes. Oh, so I you want to find before. the perfect fit, yeah. right? So also going back to what Dr. Uh, Yunus mentioned, is uh, halal dating is one tax. I think we need to name that. Do mm -hmm. we want to have sexual encounter? Mm -hmm. I think I that's see. what throws Afghans off. And I think we, that is a taboo that mm -hmm. we need to kind of name and talk about. Do we go by emotional intimacy or mm -hmm. versus physical intimacy? And the halal dating basically comes in that, no, no, we need to get, keep it emotional and no physical. Because the dating uh, word, in, you know, as it comes from the English language, really makes parents very nervous because they associate with dating mm. sexual encounter and physical encounter I versus, see. as Dr. Yunus mentioned, we can go that with emotional intimacy and not necessarily. Mm. That's something that obviously requires a lot a deeper conversation in terms of what we mean. I do have a follow-up uh, <coughs> since we're talking along the lines of culture, why is Afghan culture so strict when it comes to women? And I wanted to know from all of you, whoever would like to share, do you think the root of that is culture or religion or both? I think patriarchy, patriarchy. really creates that these um, kind of uh, imposed norms on women. Patriarchy is a, really a stance where the man need to be in power or want to be in power. Mm. So they, they dictate female behaviors mm. and interactions in a social to make sure that the society from a collectivistic society, they are within that parameters, right? The United States used to be a collectivistic society mm -hmm. as a result of industrial revolution, industrialization, urbanization, and also women's rights that actually progressed. They became less and less uh, patriarchy. I'm not saying we're totally <laughs> done with that. If However, for any of our audience members who might not know what patriarchy is, mm -hmm. would you be able to define uh, that? Patriarchy is the control of males uh, that they determine and uh, basically dictate what's good for women mm -hmm. without actually including them in, in that conversation, right? So that is basically imposed on them. Mm -hmm. What are the rules that they need to subscribe to for the society, for the social kind of, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so social interaction to be mm -hmm. within um, a, an agreed upon uh, type of, uh, um, behavior, so to speak. So in your opinion, when it comes to our culture being more strict with women, would you say that the root of it is about preserving a woman's virginity or a girl's virginity? I think that's the control from the patriarchal side. Um, and I think 
um, and and that com that comes from men dictating that, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it grows out of that. So I think that you know, for women um, in Afghan culture, we. Uh, we kind of carry the honor um, mm -hmm. of our family. And in, from that patriarchal message that we get is that uh, men are there are then to protect the women's honor and therefore they must restrict them, their behaviors and um, in order to protect that honor, virginity. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's very tied to the patriarchy um, and um, I, mean, I see some beauty to it as well, in a sense, um, the you know protection of you know of a woman. However, um, I think also that I think uh, women can protect our, ourselves and, and kind of make up our minds about that. Um, I think nice. that we should definitely always have more um, of a voice in that matter. Dr. Yunus, I would love to know: Do you think Afghan culture overreaches a little bit when it comes to our protection of women? Uh, I will see it from an anthropological point of view that Afghan society is very much tri tribal mm -hmm. and uh, tribalism uh, is uh, antithesis thesis of, of uh, uh, a civilized life. So um, even in the United States, we have people who are very, very tribal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they are living in a modern industrial advanced society but where they are very tribal mm -hmm. so um, and they are controlling women and that's why the, the divorce rate in this country is so high uh, and one reason and uh, uh, sociologically in this case is because is because they are controlling women mm -hmm. but in Afghanistan to your question there are two factors that play a major role in um, uh, curbing women's rights and and um, one is tribalism, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we are very tribal. Uh, second is the misinterpretation of, of the religious text. Mm. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm working very hard on this uh, issue in the last 10, 15 years, that uh, many um, uh, verses of the Quran uh, is misinterpreted, uh, mm -hmm. is misinterpreted against women. And there are some hadith, hadith meaning the, the, the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, that's also um, proved to be fake uh, or incorrect mm -hmm. hadith um, uh -huh. that uh, appeared after the uh, demise of the Aisha, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the second wife uh, of the Prophet of Islam or the most beloved wife of the Prophet, that um, many hadith, because Aisha, as you, as you know, she was, a, uh, she was a scholar of religion, and at the same time, Aisha was a polit politician. Mm -hmm. uh, how much she was right or, or wrong, that's another issue, but she was a politician, and uh, she was also a, school, uh, uh, a scholar of religion. But when she passed away, the tribal society of Arabs at that time noticed that if we allow women to be playing a role like Aisha did, then that is not working for that society and they created a lot of uh, hadith wrong hadith and fake hadith and they misinterpreted um, the verses of the quran mm. and it was interpreted in favor of men I see. Um, so that's my answer my next question is going to be for dr rogers now before i ask this question i would like to play a short clip from a stand-up show of Faim Anwar. He's a wonderful Afghan American comedian and he pokes fun at Afghan dating. So we're going to play the clip. White people, you like want to meet the parents so soon. Like in my culture, if you're meeting the parents, you're about to get married. So like we're hiding you for as long as possible. <laughs> you're like Anne Frank. I'm just like shoving you in the floorboards. Like, that's how the burqa was invented. Like, oh, fuck, my mom's coming. Let's put a blanket over here. This is so funny, yet incredibly revealing about our culture and the stress of hiding who you're dating from your parents until or unless you're about to get married to them. Dr. Rogers, sometimes we think that these stresses are uniquely for Afghan girls when it comes to dating, but it's not. Uh, based on your opinion, how do you think dating pressures differ when it comes to Afghan men versus Afghan women? 
Yeah, it's a good question because um, I think we do focus a lot on, on women's stressors uh, when it comes to dating um, mm -hmm. and kind of ignore somewhat the stressors that I think men go through as well um, and the cultural elements that tie in to those stressors. Um, but I think that um, for men, obviously, I think, you know, there is a precedent that's set for them, um, you know, mm -hmm. from culture to their families. Um, and what is expected of them. And I think that, that a lot of times those are very high bars um, mm -hmm. and unrealistic. Um, and also, you know, based on that patriarchal um, set of, of standards. Um, and I think that it's, it can be very, you know, um, unfair for a lot of men who feel like they feel that pressure to, to um, make sure that they're literally identifying with and manifesting all of those, um, those standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it also uh, prevents them from really uh, the growth that they need you know, um, to explore because there are so many you know, walls that they're kind of trapped behind mm -hmm. um, based on those standards. And I think for women, um, uh, obviously, you know, I think we'll be talking about that a lot, the stressors that they experience Absolutely. Um, in terms, again, standards, yeah. again. Um, I wanted to quickly ask you while mm -hmm. we're on the subject, do you have any case studies that would shine light on uh, these kinds of pressures without naming any names, of course? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that without even taking one specific case, I think in general, um, you know, I've, I've seen and witnessed um, friends, family members um, have to go through, um, you know, the, for a girl, for example, the pressure of like, you know, you are at that certain age and why don't you have, you know, why don't you have prospects of marriage, for example. So mm -hmm. that pressure, um, I think, can be incredibly uh, paralyzing for a lot of women. Um, but I think it also can push people into relationships that maybe aren't the best um, best fit, as you said, mm -hmm. I like that, which is the best fit for two people, is that pressure. And so they, they kind of uh, prematurely get into these relationships um, based on just the need and the pressure to be in one. Um, and I think that can create a lot of um, a, a ripple effect of just consequences for both people. That's why I think conversations like this are so important for us to be able to see all the different uh, pressures that we deal with as Afghans dating in the West. My next question is going to be for you, Dr. Nasrat. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to take a step back and look at the pillars of a healthy romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. So considering our cultural constraints, if a young Afghan woman and a young Afghan man want to, want to date romantically, what fundamentals should they employ to keep their relationship healthy? And if we are talking about Afghan dating in the West. Such an important, important question because I think we believe that when there is love, everything is gonna work out. Yep. And that's not <laughs> the case. Love is only an emotional reaction to what you know, we uh, basically feel as a result of hormonal processes and mm. so on. And they will fade, believe me, I can tell you that. <laughs> But what's really important is the safe space mm -hmm. and the intimacy comes from, am I being seen and heard by you? Seen and heard. So basically, can I come with who I am and not leave part of myself? Wow. Because when we date, we always come like we want to impress each other, right? Mm -hmm. We never ask about like what really bothers you, what right. is really bad about you, yeah. what you don't <laughs> like about yourself, you know? We yeah. always go like we want to impress each other. Absolutely. So genuineness and really authenticity, mm -hmm. also feeling safe, giving the notion that I can see you and I can accept you for who you are and wow. not what I want you to be. Right. Because when I want you to be the person that you're not, mm -hmm. then you're going to please me. A mm -hmm. pleaser becomes depressed, anxious, and tra traumatized. And that will really impact the rest of their life. Absolutely. That's how I see it. But also there's trust, mm -hmm. obviously, that's the second part. Communication, we don't really communicate very well in our culture. We, you know, obviously I may be wrong, but I think that we're not communicating directly and openly with each other. Absolutely. We go with a lot of, you know, kind of uh, going around the bushes and so on, before to get to the point, it's gonna like, you know, a year or so later and then we come right. with a lot of the resentment mm -hmm. and anger and passive aggressiveness as to how to uh, get rid of those messages that we heard and we did not 
and the opportunity to defend ourselves. So communication is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, set, and then also finally also knowing what is important for you. Right. What do you want from this relationship? Right. What are you looking for? Is it intimacy? Is it really marriage later on? Is it just having a relationship and romantic and move on, right? right. That's really important because if we don't really um, agree on those issues, it can be very confusing to both and a lot of blame can surface because of the lack of communication. So you're talking about intentions. You feel that people should make their intentions very clear from the very beginning? Absolutely. And that's why knowing yourself is so important. Absolutely. You know, because we teenagers date, yeah. young adults date, but they don't know what they want, exactly. you know, with all the respect, you know, yeah. because you know, that's the developmental process. You know, the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. is not developed that way mm -hmm. to actually can think about the consequences of our actions. But with experience and later on taking the time to reflect and to really, like you said, purposefully, intentionally ask myself, what do I really want from this relationship? Absolutely. How do I show up? Do I show up with my whole self, with my flaws, and everything that makes me who I am, or do I want to impress somebody that's based on false? I can relate to that wholeheartedly, mm. and I would like to share a little bit of my own story and then get some feedback for Dr. Yunus. Um, so when I was 25, I met uh, an Afghan man who asked for my hand in marriage pretty quickly. Uh, we knew each other for three months before we got engaged and six months before we got married and um, absolutely we had that, fell into that problem of kind of trying to impress each other mm. and we both were wearing a mask of, you know, our cultural expectations of what I should mm -hmm. show up as, what he should show up as, uh, but unfortunately unrealistic expectations and a lack of maturity on both sides, I would say. Um, ended in a very devastating divorce for us, mm. uh, which is part of the reason why I'm doing this show. So other people don't have to go through the same struggles and get an opportunity to really find out for themselves what is a healthy way <laughs> to go about things so they don't end up you know, spending years of their life in a situation where they're not seen and not heard and the um, basics and foundation of the relationship that they're creating isn't starting from an unhealthy way. Mm. So hopefully we can tackle some of that here. May but I say something about this? Because I really appreciate your mm -hmm. vulnerability. Yeah. That takes courage yeah. and that takes also coming forward saying, I learned a lesson mm -hmm. and I want to share that and collective, collectively with everything, with everybody who's going through this journey and didn't know. So mm -hmm. I really personally appreciate yeah, that. Thank 100%. you so much. Yeah. Um, so despite the heartache <laughs> and devastation, uh, we were blessed with a beautiful child that we're co-parenting. But my question with, for Dr. Yunus is going to be, um, I know that everyone's journey is unique. In my case, I found that if my ex-husband and I had had the opportunity to date freely without the pressure of family and culture, we would have probably realized that we were not compatible for, my, for marriage. Mm -hmm. Uh, while, many, while many young Afghan men and women are encouraged to get to know the other person before considering dating, my question would be, how can that be actually done um, when it requires a few years of dating? And me meanwhile, Afghan culture leaves no room for that kind of extended relationship before marriage. So Dr. Yunus, if you can give us your advice on that, how can we get to know someone when there is just no room for an extended relationship that, as we've learned, usually takes a little bit of time? Um, well, um, I'd like to bring your attention um, on young dating and also middle-aged dating. Mm. As you know, I've been uh, working with families for the last 25, 35 years settling divorces and going and officiating marriages. Uh, I'm performing nikah, nikah among uh, uh, African families, including in Europe and Canada and United States. And I've been counseling families for, uh, but I call it family cultural counseling, not just family counseling, because family counseling is mostly based on on uh, American uh, or Western psychology. Uh, family cultural counseling that I do is based on 
Islamic values and some nuts and bolts of Islam of, of Afghan culture. And um, they are young dating uh, that, that uh, very emotional mm. uh, and um, uh, the choosing of the partner is, is, is wrong. For example, we choose a man because he is educated mm -hmm. or, or he is rich or he's coming from a good stock or family background. Right. Those are not making a good marriage. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, we are choosing a girl who is kind of very subdued or um, have not been dating somebody else mm -hmm. and um, kind of quote unquote pure. Uh, and um, and she is uh, relatively educated. Right. And uh, and then since we are very tribal, even the mm -hmm. educated class, and thank you for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the majority of Afghan men, they have a tumor in the back of their head, and that's <laughs> tribalism. And oh, that uh, uh, bring uh, a lot of problem because uh, they want to control, they have, to, they have their own expectation. They don't see their wife as equal uh, to themselves. Like, mm. I see my wife, Fauzia, uh, as equal to myself. Mm. And I've been married for 47 years, and we don't have yeah. children that they bond us together because of so we have differences and and the prophet of islam says that the difference of opinion is a blessing of my oma so we have mm -hmm. we could have differences but we sit at the table and then solve our differences that so, is beautiful uh, i used to do some uh, pre-marriage counseling mm -hmm. a long time ago but the, it was not very popular among afghans uh, i did only two or three couples pre-marriage counseling uh, yeah, because uh, I'm part of Afghan Coalition, a nonprofit organization in Northern California, and I established uh, Afghan domestic violence prevention uh, to to help families. But uh, there are, um, I, I created a formula uh, for you as an answer, mm -hmm. and I'm every nikah, every nikah or wedding I'm participating, I mention right. this to the couple, yeah. and that is four C's and one T. Four Communication, and one team. consultation, uh, cooperation, compromise, and trust. Wow. Uh, so these things should be very much established between a couple before even going to, to marry. I love and that. And also men and women both mm -hmm. should acknowledge the fact that we are created free mm -hmm. and uh, we are born on the basis of some, some moral principles, not just by controlling and Right. Tell me what to do and not to do, and right. this and that. We don't communicate as uh, uh, I think Dr. Right. Nasad said. It, it was it, we are not communi communicating these things. Yeah. That how we can make a good couple. Right. We are talking about the wedding. We are talking <laughs> about uh, how many people we should invite. Right. But we are not talking how we should make a good couple. Absolutely. And and, and, yeah. and we need to. Uh, and also one more thing. Yeah. A lot of interference of families mm. in, 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 in Afghan young or youth uh, lifestyle. And that we need to also teach or train parents to stop interfering in their children's affairs. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually, one of the things that you pointed out a little bit earlier when it comes to Afghan men and women and some of the differences, I would love to ask, um, the two beautiful, brilliant ladies over here. Um, what do you, why do you think that there is such a huge double standard when it comes to Afghan guys who can date very freely versus Afghan girls who cannot, or I, I guess I should say are not allowed or able to? Where do you think that double standard comes from? Patriarchy? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say enough about yeah. that because I think yeah. What they are con being, con and I really empathize a lot with Afghan males. That's not something that they chose, right? So they have been conditioning from early childhood. In fact, that you know you can do anything you want, and so on. And that's uh, children need boundaries, healthy boundaries, growing up. And for males not to have that, right? Mm -hmm. I have a son, and I the first day I told him is like, you know, you need to be seeing everyone equally, but I don't have to tell you, you need to experience it and come to the conclusion yourself. Right. Because if I impose something, you're gonna react to it. I can assure you that. So what happens is that um, you know the, the patriarchy really allows them, you can do anything what you want. It's actually entitlement. Mm -hmm. right. The sense of entitlement, when we go from that, it becomes also 
partially narcissistic, if you think about it, I can do anything. Uh, and that's why um, I would also add to it that there is a little bit fragile ego that comes from that. So uh, with every single rejection, the Afghan male probably will be a lot more uh, hurt and so on, but not. So when you say thing. patriarchy, do you think that stan stems from Afghan, uh, the Afghan tribal mindset? Yes, I think it's control, right? So control, control, how to make sure that we don't deviate from the cultural norms, right? Mm -hmm. And so who holds power? So who actually the, uh, sa says uh, what, are the norm what the norms are for female behaviors? And so basically uh, it's a double standard because the males may not have been told that it's not okay to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So they grew up with that consciousness mm -hmm. of it's okay for me to do that, but I don't think that will happen if you are not conditioned. Versus females, it's all about being modest, mm -hmm. being uh, really showing um, your your modesty, mm -hmm. and anything else that you deviate from that brings shame to the family. We never associate anything to the male Afghan male bringing shame to the family. Absolutely. It's always the female who's being blamed to bring shame for the sake of greater good to create the cohesiveness it's kind of a facade cohesiveness right. yeah. not necessarily actually Absolutely. would you agree no, with totally, that? totally agree yeah and I think that you know I think you and this show hopefully will bring about um, the to breaking that stereo you know that stereotype that we have and and the conditioning we have to be able to break it and a lot of times that takes courage mm -hmm. which you know you obviously demonstrated um in sharing your story and being open about you know the struggles that we have mm -hmm. um and and challenging those um norms that we've been conditioned mm -hmm. um and grown up with right. um, because they don't you know does it does does this standard apply to me should mm -hmm. it um and questioning those things um, and having those safe spaces in our community to be able to yeah. have those conversations um, and uh, you know challenge those stereotypes. Yeah, and I, I think that's what's lacking in our community is conversations like these where people are being vulnerable because there's a lot of people who are going through these struggles and not enough uh, opportunity or safe spaces exist for us to be able to talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, so after being divorced a few years, I found myself in a different situation, which was the complete polar opposite of what I had known in my unhealthy marriage. Uh, but I met a wonderful man who happens to be a complete from a completely different culture and background. Uh, we dated for about a year and ended up getting engaged. Um, and after being a single mom who was all by myself in a different state, um, and being, I think my family had some kind of influence on how fast we moved when it came to getting engaged, you know, because of culture and Madum Chimeka and you're there by yourself. Um, but fast forward about a year or two, I ended up taking a break from that relationship because I learned that um, for the first time, I want to consciously mm -hmm. on my own choose for myself, mm -hmm. um, I guess, and assess what it is that I want outside of any external influences and worrying about, you know, what my family thinks or what my culture thinks and giving myself that freedom to really take my time mm -hmm. um, and being, you know, transparent with my family about my need to do so and not jump from, you know, one marriage into another marriage. Uh, so it's been quite beautiful having the opportunity to just kind of be on my own to figure out what I want. Um, but I think that there's definitely a double standard when it comes to having a partner who is not Afghan. Um, I've seen from my own family that the pressure is eased a little bit when he's not Afghan. That's kind of like, okay, well, you know, we'll give you a little bit of room <laughs> to kind of take a little bit of time to figure this out. Uh, but I wanted to know why that's the case when our, that our parents kind of come down a little bit when the other person is not Afghan. So what, whoever would like to kind of chime in on that. You know, I would like that. to say something about uh, Mark Twain, uh, yeah. an American writer, amazing. He, when he was seven, uh, 15, he said, oh my goodness, this father of mine is so horrible and uh, you know, he's totally stupid basically. <laughs> he came back at 27 and said, oh my father has changed a lot. Wow. So what does it tell us? That Mark Twain himself went through developmental growth. 
right. that he, from teenage years, grew into adulthood. Right. Your story really resonates with me by saying you grew, you mm -hmm. grew, and you took it in your own hands and conscious, right? And so your parents actually respected that. Mm -hmm. When we are lost, when we are this confused, parents come to our rescue. Mm -hmm. They tell us what to do. Yeah. But when we gain our confidence, I also want to uh, mention, which we haven't talked about, m female in relation to economic situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eco economy plays a huge role in terms of early marriage, right. historically speaking. Yeah. And Afghanistan, I don't even want, uh, I'm not talking about Afghanistan, this is a whole different context. But now here is all about the, 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 the more stable you are economically, the more likely you will postpone marriage and the more likely that you will take time, the more likely there is also a high rate of divorce. <laughs> ah, that makes absolute sense. My next question is going to be to you, Dr. Rogers. Most Afghans who reach out to me or who I've spoken to, they have um, an internal battle that they're kind of going through. Um, they are Afghans who are dating other Afghans and they have this need to make it work under very stressful and sometimes unhealthy circumstances, um, mostly because they want a partner who fits that cultural mold of what they or their families want or what they're told that they should be having a partner. Uh, but under what circumstances would you say that um, these couples should let go? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously when, you know, things just aren't working <laughs> yeah. um, and when things get toxic or yeah. dysfunctional um, or, you know, people in the relationship don't feel fulfilled or mm -hmm. as, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, they don't feel heard, they don't feel seen um, and those needs are being unmet um, in the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I think that any time that someone doesn't feel unfulfilled um, or that. doesn't feel like um, there's a mutual respect and trust in the relationship, I think that's when um, you know the couple should definitely look at other options, including obviously working and addressing those issues in the relationship. But if you know there isn't um, a resolution, then I think that's when eventually you have to let go. I see. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so this question is going to be for all three of you, and whoever would like to chime in, please feel free to do so. Um, the question is that Afghans who came to this, this country decades ago. They've definitely, as we know, all of us here, um, they've relaxed their viewpoints towards dating a little bit. But now we have 100,000 new Afghan refugees who've recently landed in America, and there are many kids and young people amongst them. How big of a hurdle do you think they will face as they get older and start to date? After all, their parents are coming from Afghanistan, um, and that Afghanistan is actually even more conservative than the Afghanistan that our parents perhaps came from. I think um, the, the more recent refugees and immigrants also have a different level of trauma, mm -hmm. okay, psychological trauma. If this trauma is not being, I don't think that trauma will completely go away but right. it will decrease the level. So the intensity, frequency, and duration of trauma experiences, when they're not addressed, mm -hmm. that can have huge implications on several incoming generations. Mm -hmm. So the intergener, yeah, go ahead. So sorry, I wanted you to quickly just define trauma because yeah. I feel that um, for any Afghans who aren't very familiar with the term, most people associate trauma with something that obviously mm -hmm. our country has gone through a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where it's war or just these extreme cases of um, hardships that we've gone mm -hmm. through. But what would you define so trauma So in Farsi as? we call it satme ruhi. But satme it's also ruhi. a situation what was, uh, that you went through that you felt you didn't have control. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we find ourselves in a jungle mm -hmm. and we are faced with a bear and there is a freeze and flight, right? So we either fight or we f well, obviously I will fight because you know <laughs> that's the adrenaline that comes in it's and says you need to escape, right? <laughs> but when we are in a situation where we cannot fight mm -hmm. and flight, we become helpless. Mm -hmm. And that helplessness, because of a result of perceived lack of control, c really creates trauma. 
mm -hmm. traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And that can show in severe anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and debilitation, basically. Mm -hmm. So to your point, to your question, um, this particular generation that came out of Afghanistan recently, they're also very diverse when it comes to their lived experiences, mm -hmm. you know, urban, uh, rural, all of that together. Um, it, it, they will have a lot a hard time because mm -hmm. they also came out of completely different context. You know, the collapse of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They are they're carrying some resentment. They're mm -hmm. maybe carrying some residuals of. What happened? You know, mm -hmm. I was doing well, and their sense of betrayal, maybe, mm -hmm. and that needs to be uh, processed and needs to be discussed. Otherwise, that can have ramification for the next generation. I'm seeing it uh, with the newly arrived Afghans, just the mm -hmm. struggle um, of adjusting, not to mention, you know, dating or relationships or anything, just mm -hmm. adjusting to this life yeah. um, and, and, um, acknowledging and struggling with everything they've lost um, and that event you know i think there can conti there's continued losses as well in terms of mm -hmm. um the family that's left behind in terms of whether there will be a country um in the future um that they can recognize and call home um so i think there's a lot and i think there um i, I think as as afghans who've been here for a long time i think um i hope that we can help them adjust mm -hmm. um better mm -hmm. and Provide the services in a culturally uh, responsive ways uh, that can meet their meet their huge, <laughs> yeah. huge needs that, that that they have and the trauma that they are continuing to suffer. Dr. Yunus, how do you think we can rectify this kind of mindset? Um, first of all, the Professor uh, Rogers said it very beautifully that this issue is across cultures. Mm -hmm. There are many Americans that they killed their girlfriends. And I've been here for 44 years, and I've seen it on TV every month. But, uh, but not, I guess the not, question is that when that does happen, the community here, they, don't, they wouldn't sit and blame the woman. In our community, well, why would we blame we, we, the woman? We get, we get into that. As I said, um, I always see things from a tribal, tribalism point of view anthropologically. These are all tribal mentality. Because uh, in Afghanistan, they see women as no moose, mm -hmm. and they see women, uh, and they see if they violate some uh, cultural norms, that's beghayrati, uh, and, and, and they can't tolerate that. Tell us so, what no moose means in English. Well, uh, no moose uh, basically translated as honor, uh, that women are the honor of the family, mm -hmm. and they have to be protected. And Gairat is like a zeal, and um, if, if somebody, a, a woman, violate that, that is uh, touch the men's uh, mindset uh, as, as Gairat. So these are uh, tribal mentality that, that they do not allow uh, uh, girls to, to date and uh, uh, allow their sons to date, uh, which I totally disagree. There's also um, uh, an issue of um, uh, uh, identity. Uh, when these um, immigrants, and we all came here, I came here when I was 20, 27 years old, and now I'm 71, I had my own uh, uh, problems uh, how to adjust, and it was a matter of assimilation and in integration and adaptation. So happily, I managed to, to survive. Uh, it's a matter of identity uh, within the youth especially because they are coming with a bag of culture mm -hmm. and when they open this bag of culture they, they are not able to uh, distinguish which is good for this society and which is bad for this society. And also um, I'm working with different organizations uh, on immigrants and we give presentations to immigrants how to live here with peace and, and, and security. Uh, it, it, this is a problem of our training too. We don't train them properly about adaptation, about integration, about the new culture, the new society. This is the, the, the job of not only parents, but organization who receive them. They Absolutely. just give them a, a apartment housing and some salary or income and health insurance, but they, it's not really they are not working very hard on on how to how to um, train them to live in a, in a new society. And there's a lot of uh, cultural differences. Um, um, 
that is very huge and um, we have to train them properly and um, because um, many Afghans even they lived here for 20 years mm -hmm. they are living uh, with a lost identity they don't know they are Afghans they are Americans or they are Muslims you mm -hmm. know and it's a salad and hodgepodge of all these things yeah. and that makes life very hard that uh, like in your case uh, that you uh, choose to have a non-Afghan as your partner that's your that's your right and that is uh, anybody over age of 18 that is her or his right mm -hmm. but why they don't take it uh, uh, softly is, is, is so it's, islamically uh, I just want to clarify it is my freedom to choose but culturally well, uh, we don't give Islam, women that choice uh, according to Islam so Islam do not uh, allow allow uh, Muslim girls to uh, to marry non-Muslims and of course uh, in this society and they, they, they of course Muslim scholars they have their own uh, um, reasons and I have written an article about that because many girls calling me and say it is my nikah and this date so I'm asking is your uh, fiance is, uh, is Muslim or non-Muslim he says non-Muslim. So I send him that article uh, to read that and then discuss it with, with his fiance and understand your parents position and all that right. because um, in uh, happily it, it worked uh, about 90 percent this this article that I wrote seven years ago it worked wow. but this is a big issue within Muslim families mm -hmm. whether they're practicing or not practicing Muslims. Yeah. That's not the issue. But when it comes to their daughter, because that's their nomus and their gairat, and then <laughs> going to marry a non-Muslim, that's a big issue. So we have to find different ways how to solve this 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 problem. Because um, you could do some uh, reform within the Islamic uh, Sharia. I don't call it law because law is different than Sharia. Uh, so I, I don't call it Islamic law. I call it Islamic Sharia. So um, there are a lot of issues that uh, we have to work and tackle these problems uh, to make things easier for our girls and our young 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 men. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, basically, this issue of uh, it's a cultural identity issue, yeah. uh, lack of training, uh, um, new as as new immigrant, absolutely uh, uh, knowing knowing their new homeland like mm. United States of America. Uh, their culture, uh, so there's a lot of uh, language barriers. Yeah. We some of them do know English, but they do not know the English of this this culture. And 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 and, and we have many many examples like. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, Mahala, I wish I wish we had more time to discuss yeah. this a little bit further, uh, but it is a pretty pretty short show. Hopefully, we're gonna have all of you back for a future topic so we can discuss this a little bit further. Uh, but I just wanted to. Thank you all sincerely from the bottom of my heart for being here, for sharing your wisdom, your expertise. I think conversations like this are so valuable and I have no doubt that it will make a positive impact on our community. And I will see all three of you in our two next episodes and hopefully you guys as well. And now it is time for New Views. Today's New View. Afghans need to learn how to date in a healthier way. Now I know that statement will draw in a lot of criticism from conservative Afghans, but hear me out. The reality is that Afghans of all ages are already dating, whether you like it or not. If you have a young son or daughter, chances are they're already in the dating world. Perhaps they're dating secretly out of fear of what their families might think or say. Of course, this isn't always the case. I know that some of my Afghan girlfriends are openly dating, and in some cases, they're openly dating other Afghans. Needless to say, times have changed, but here's what needs to evolve. Afghan parents and families who place shame and guilt on their children for dating. The weight of that pressure is crushing for all Afghans, particularly for young women so much so that they lie, hide, or take on a completely second identity outside of the family household. And if they get caught, they're branded a liar and shamed from here to oblivion. But let me tell you, these people don't want to lie or keep things hidden from you. They just don't know any better. 
and they do it out of fear. Yes, fear. If they don't lie, they could face serious consequences and be labeled as wild, a slut, or being too free. So they adapt to hiding it or lying about it to protect themselves. Look, I know we come from a very conservative culture. I mean, what's happening in Afghanistan is at the extreme end of the spectrum. But how can people from a conservative culture date in a healthy way? It almost seems impossible, doesn't it? Well, here's a thought. Whether we consider ourselves a conservative or liberal Afghan, we have to teach our children what a healthy relationship looks like and have open, honest dialogue with them. What does this mean? Let's say you consider your family to be traditional, conservative, or religious. Ask yourself what a safe and healthy dating situation would look like for your son or daughter. Under what parameters would you accept them finding their ideal partner? Would dating be limited to group activities with an expectation that they shouldn't have sex until the nikah or marriage? Is there a time limit on how long they can see this other person before making a decision about getting engaged? Whatever your rules may be, please have that conversation with them. We have to be absolutely honest with ourselves that we live in a society where dating, sex, and intimacy are considered to be the norm, and that's not our fault. We're surrounded by it in TV shows, movies, social media, in schools, and throughout American culture. So it's going to be difficult to safeguard your values and morals in this hypersexualized culture, but it is not impossible. Now, if you're from a liberal Afghan household, you have to do the same thing. Clearly explain your boundaries to your children. Because you know what? Sometimes you may consider yourself to be a progressive or liberal Afghan family, but all of a sudden your limits are crossed and you start to implement some old school rules that may shock your son or your daughter. And both traditional and liberal Afghan households need to understand that if your son or daughter dates someone, it doesn't automatically mean that the relationship will lead to marriage. And in most cases, in this day and age, it will not. After all, that's what dating is for, to realize what our needs are in a relationship and to find a partner who's compatible with us. And if they're not allowed to learn more about a person in the framework of healthy dating and they're rushed into marriage, it could lead to a devastating divorce. When there's transparency on both sides, the chances are for them to find a compatible and healthy partner will go up, way up. At the end of the day, secrecy and too much restriction will cause internal conflicts and unhealthy behavior. Here's another thought. Parents, what if you took out your son or daughter when they're still teenagers and taught them what a healthy first date looks like? What if an Afghan dad takes out his teenage daughter and shows her how a gentleman should act? Moms can do that with their sons too, or whatever configuration works for you. And most importantly, Tell your children what your expectations are of their significant other. Should they only get to know Afghans? Are Americans or non-Muslims not acceptable? Or what if they're Afghan and from another tribe or social class? The ground rules can be set on both sides and your kids may even negotiate some of their own. The point is, our culture has had the unfortunate and heartbreaking experience of being forced to go backwards in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, those of us in the US are living in an American culture that is in direct contract with many traditional Afghan values. Whether we've chosen this country or it was chosen for us, let's remember that dating here is inevitable. But healthy dating can be taught and it can be a choice. Well, that's the end of our show today. We hope you've enjoyed watching and perhaps we've stirred some interesting conversations in your household. Join us for our next episode, which will tackle another huge topic in Afghan culture, shame, guilt, and judgment. You are not going to want to miss that one. I am your host, Nahid Jahed, for Tuti Khalafiz for now.